Good morning. There we go. <laughs> Too many buttons on this thing. It's really cool. Well, thank you for the honor of, of being with you today. Um, I love uh, I love leading worship. I love when um, when we're in worship together, right? And so when we're standing here, and I can I can hear you singing, and some of you are singing harmony, and some of you are singing your own tunes. That's fine. It's wonderful, and it's exactly what I think of heaven. I think of everybody singing praises to our God. Right? So today I'm going to share with you uh, something that God put on my heart a number of weeks ago, probably at least six weeks ago. And I woke up one day and he said, in the image of, I went, hmm, in the image of. You see, we're in a tension, if you will, a battle. I'll refer to it right now as a tension between two images. God, God's image, we were created in his image, and the image that man creates God in. Let me say that again. One image is the image that God created us in, and the other image is man creating God in man's Right? And there's a tension, there's a pull there. It's like a rubber band. And sometimes we live, and I'm going to say we, I should say I, sometimes I live on one side of that or the other. <laughs> it really depends on the day, I guess, or it really depends on how influenced I am by what's going on around us. But we live in this tension of God created us in his image and man, us, creating God in our image. And we are challenged to live a certain way that is contrary to popular, popular opinion. If we live in the image of God, that is unpopular in our society, isn't it? So you see where that tension is. You see where that battle then, the lines are drawn, that we're in that battle, in that moment between one world and the next. So if I were to ask, and this is participation, you can just yell it out. If I said, God is, what do you say? Great. Awesome. What else? Love. What else? Holy. Powerful. Holy, forgiving, oh, healing, healing, thank you. No, 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 it's my ears. <laughs> Not accustomed to it. What did else did I hear? Redeemer, hallelujah, right? God is. You see, there's a, there's a paradigm, and that might be, a, that's a big ACT word, paradigm, right? Paradigm uh, is is really has to do with mindsets. It has to do with beliefs. It has to do with values. It has to do with habits. And so we have two paradigms that we're working in right now or that we're living in. And again, that tension is one paradigm or the other. So I have some questions for you. How many of you right now are feeling a little conflicted right now? Mm. Don't have to raise your hands. Do you know what to believe or who to believe on what's going on around us? What media doesn't have an agenda? I just got political, didn't I? All right. Yeah, right. Right. Um, well, we're in church. We can talk about religion and politics, right? Okay. Um, whose values resonate with your values or our values? And how do I treat someone totally different? And it's been, it's almost as if the world, well, you know what? That's a true statement. The world lives in a worldly paradigm and does not operate from a, a heavenly or a kingdom paradigm. 
Now, I'm a young man of 60. I'm believing it. I held on to 59 as long as I could. I even found my birth certificate that said exactly what time I was born. So I, I knew exactly when I turned 60. Now, in my lifetime, there have been a lot of changes, and there's just a few people in here that might be a little bit older than I am. But in our lifetime, there's been, there's never, ever, as far as I know, there's never been such division as what we have right now. It is incredible what's going on. We had, I say we, uh, it's like I walked up the hill both ways in the snow. We had, right, relative peace in our politics. Now, there were fights, but we had relative peace. There was some integrity there. We subscribed to a biblical moral code, typically, when I was growing up. Americans tolerated differences of opinion. They spoke up, but they tolerated differences of opinion with respect. We generally believed that we were created male and female, and that marriage was between a man and a woman. Values such as honesty, integrity, responsibility, and faith were admirable characteristics in people. When I do those, uh, those values tests, I don't know if anybody in here has done that. Some of those come up on me because that's core in my being from growing up. We believe that a strong work ethic uh, was nearly a divine gift for everyone. Early in my life, life was precious and it was protected. And then we have this thing called Entropy, the law of entropy. The law of entropy is this concept that things do not move to order. They move to chaos. to disorder or chaos. Think about it this way. It's a real good illustration. Our son did a, a science project on this. And he uh, put a, a platform, put it on a gear. It was probably Capsella or something like that. Put it on a gear. He's now in, uh, works for Warner Brothers. He's kind of the brilliant one. He put it on a gear, and he put... Um, Lego figures all around, and then he cranked it. So as he cranked, what happened? They fell off, right? That's the law of entropy. Things tend to move towards chaos. And so if you, if you, you know, we didn't, I didn't create that law. God created that law, right? Real quick. And hopefully, in about four minutes, I'll be done with the real deep stuff, right? All right. So moral, moral relativism. And within moral relativism, you have paganism, pantheism, humanism, and atheism. All right? So you've got all those isms in moral relativism, and they're all examples of humans creating God in their own image. Because humans want to have control. God is in control. God is a God of order, not disorder. Humans want to be in control and create their own God in their own image, which is disorder. Okay? The law of entropy. All right. Moral, All right. Relativism, moral relativism, relativism teaches that there's, teaches no, moral there's no moral truth. truth. That truth is relative, truth to, each is relative to each person. Does that sound familiar? That sound familiar? What is right for what me is right, right and, and what is right, right for you is right. Is right. You don't have you don't to. Have you don't to, have the right, have to, the tell right to tell me what is me right, what for, is me. right for, me. for me. Have Have we have heard, have that, we stuff? heard that stuff? We hear or instead of believing that God is the foundation and authority of all truth, there's that tension, right? Okay, pa paganism. Paganism is the movement to worship the. the earth and all the animals. 
having dominion is a responsibility to steward well what has been given us. Paganism. Paganism is worshiping the earth, giving earth the power over the world, if you will, humanity. Coexist stickers are popular. We've seen some of those. They've been popular for a little bit. Uh, because people can't handle that some people are not going to be in eternity with God, right? That's why that's popular. But what that is is pantheism, uh, and the pantheism deceives people into believing that there are many ways to enlightenment, in quotes, instead of believing in one God who makes a way for us to spend eternity in complete fellowship with him. Jesus, the only one and only son who paid the price for our salvation. He is the one that makes it makes our way into complete fellowship with God. He redeemed us for our unholiness so that we can spend that time with, with God. But that's in direct conflict with pantheism, right? That says any God, all gods are a way to get to God, get to heaven. Humanism is a pervasive view that humanity is the source of all good and that humans have ultimate power to create God in whatever image suits them instead of believing that God is the creator and source of all. That's humanism. Hmm. Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? It seems like we're being bombarded with these isms all the time, right? And we are. We are being bombarded with these isms all the time all the time, and told that these are right and what we believe is wrong. There's the tension. There's the battle. Humanism and atheism are closely aligned. Can you see that? More and more, we are challenged to believe that there is no God, that God is as ridiculous a thought as Santa Claus, that we are all, we have all been lied to and manipulated instead of believing that we are all uniquely created for a purpose, and that our God loves us so much that he wants to be with us in all eternity. There's the conflict. There's the battle. If morality is relative, then all is, a re is relative, right? If morality is relative, then all is relative. Marriage is relative. The sacred union is no longer sacred between a man and a woman. Origin is relative. Gender identity is a choice. What? Boys are not boys. Girls are not girls. That's, that's crazy thinking, right? In my mind. In our minds, right? I see your looks. Life is relative. It's quite all right to kill a baby that is inconveniently conceived. Purity is relative. There's no standard for purity. Godly purity is a fading memory. Truth is relative. Truth is whatever I believe is true for me, and, and there is no source of truth. And let's talk. We're going to wrap this up, this part up. Let's talk about the fruit we see on media news outlets right now. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. It is totally acceptable to spew anger, offense, depending on which side you're on, um, dishonesty, injustice, hate, and bigotry without an ounce of consequence for the wake of destruction and deception. What we have witnessed is a trend to speak, what we have witnessed is a trend to speak love peace, tolerance, and acceptance out of one side of the mouth while speaking hate, lies, anger, and malice out of the other side of the mouth. Now think about that. You speak Jesus out of one side, you speak hate out of the other side, what does it do? It ties your lips up in knots, right? And you lose all credibility, right? And you're not speaking in tongues, right? It just ties your lips up in knots. But sometimes I find myself with a critical spirit on the one side and speaking love on Jesus on the other. So I'm not throwing a stone. This stuff is real. The battle is real. American culture does not move towards a creator. It moves away from a creator. And that is the law of entropy. Yes, the battle is real. Our enemy comes to do what? Right. Steal, kill, destroy, deceive, 
Think of all the things that our enemy does. He is the great deceiver. And yet, Jesus pointed this out. And it was in Matthew 7, 23, 21, 22, 23, when, when people were saying, hey, we, we have done miracles. We have prophesied in your name. We have done signs, wonders, miracles. And Jesus says to them, I don't know you. You're not of me. You have created God in your own image. That's my paraphrase. And so they don't have fellowship with Jesus, even though they were deceiving their world with signs, wonders, and miracles. That is just like, just kind of gets me all crazy. We have one who creates us. We have one who saves us, and we have one who empowers us. Creates, saves, empowers, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Creates, saves, and empowers. We're created in the image of God. We are saved by the blood of Jesus, and we are indwelled with the Holy Spirit, to overcome all the ploys of this world. And that is what gives us power to truly live lives in our true identity in the image of God. First scripture I want to share with you and is Genesis 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image. And this is out of the New Living Translation, to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth, and the small animals that scurry along the ground. I've seen some of those in my backyard. So God created beings, human beings, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. And soon after that, in chapter 3, 2 through 7, is when when humankind, mankind, was deceived by Satan. So God creates us in his image for a very specific purpose in this world. See, he created mankind in his image for what? Fellowship. Think about that. God spent time with Adam and Eve. He walked with them. He fellowshiped with them. He talked with them. He, he, he was used to just hanging out with them. I would say that Adam and Eve, not only did they have a healthy respect for God, their creator, but I would say that they were actually friends with God. They hung out. They played Bananagram. Right? With no competition, right? They, they did things like that, right? They did that. He spent time. He walked with him, talked with him. He was so concerned that Adam needed a workmate that he put him to sleep, took a rib out of him, took that rib, and created a woman. Now that is just cool, right? And I don't think Adam was saying that, like Paul said, that was a thorn in his side. No, I don't think that was it at all. That was just cool. God creates us. He creates us with intellect, with spirit, with soul, with emotions, and with physical bodies. He also creates us with desires, goals, and drives. He creates us with special talents and gifts. He creates us uniquely for a purpose because we are created in the image of God. So say this, I am created in the image of God. Oh, come on. Say it like you mean it. Fantastic. Yes. Now, I would, I would recommend that you put that on your mirror in the morning <laughs> and you repeat that to yourself until you really believe it. Now, you ever think of how God actually looks? Hmm. He looks marvelous. He looks like you. Now turn to your neighbor and say, you look marvelous. 
And say it like you mean it. All right. <laughs> you look marvelous. And that's how God looks. If you ever wonder how God looks, just look around you. Because he created you in his likeness, in his image. Every bit of you is created in God's likeness, in his image. From the molecules in your blood to the hair follicles on your head, right? You are created in the image of God. Every, every bit of you. So I ask you this, to who, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, let me just say this, to who we devote ourselves, we commit ourselves, right? To who we commit ourselves, we, they, they control us. To who we give control, we follow. And to who we follow, we believe. And to who we believe, we surrender. So let me say that again. To who we devote, ourselves we commit to who we commit we will control us to who we give control we follow and to who we follow we believe and to who we believe we surrender so that's a lot of words there and i'm not going to go into each one of those thankfully because we're almost done devote commit follow believe surrender so we have a choice to make who do we surrender ourselves to? Think about where surrender comes from. It's at the end, right? But then it's a circle. Devote, commit, follow, believe, surrender. If we surrender to the worldview that is so prevalent in America, we will devote ourselves to it. Can you see that? Yeah. So how do I manage this barrage of worldview in my life? The first answer is... First answer is to understand whose image you are created in. Whose image defines you? Is it a world? Is it an image that you have created? Or is it an image that God created? Regardless of how true you think that is, it's still true because God created it. Right? And then answer these. Am I living in the created image of God? Or am I living in my created image? Are my behaviors and habits reflective of God's created image or my created image? So who I believe I am will define and reinforce my habits. That's, that's mind-blowing. It's so simple, right? We behave based on who we think we are. And who we think we are is how we behave. Right? But so who are you? Jesus says who you are when speaking to his father. And listen to this. He says, and he's praying to God. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Say this, I am in the world, but not of the world. I am in the world, but not of the world. And isn't that, it might be another thing you put on your mirror. <laughs> You're going to have lots of things on your mirror. So devote, commit, follow, believe, surrender. And then I'm going to add one more, receive. I'm reading this book called Atomic Habits, which basically is a premise that, that we, we can change how we are based on little habits that we do that reflect what we, who we say we are. That's the basic premise of the book. So I'll give you an example. If I exercise regularly, then I am an athlete. So if I have the habit of exercising, then my identity is as an athlete. If I want to be an athlete, then I have to do what? Exercise. 
regularly, right? Once a month is not enough, but it has to be a routine. It has to be a habit. See where that comes? So if I want to be a, a good husband to Sandy, then I have to understand what a good husband looks like, the habits of a good husband, and then I have to do those habits. If I do those habits, then I will become a good husband, right? And so that is the, that is the basic premise of this book. Now, let's put a little spiritual spin on that. If we are a child of God, then what do we do? What habits do we do that would reflect or, or show the world, prove, or bring us closer to that, that identity? We would spend time with him, wouldn't we? We would pray. We would worship, right? We would meditate. We would study. We would read, we would read scripture. We would study scripture. We would actually read those notes at the bottom of the page, right? We would develop a routine every single day that would reinforce that identity, wouldn't it? It would be a habit, see? So that's the challenge that I have for you today, is one, decide who you are. And if you say, I'm a child of God, then let's figure out, you don't have to have all the answers, let's figure out what it means to be a child of God. And what habits a child of God actually has. And if you do that, then you will become who you want to become, right? Who God actually created you to be, right? And that's the, that's the purpose, right? God created you in his image, right? You don't have to search for that identity. All you have to do is work through all the junk that this worldly paradigm has thrown in our way, right? And it's a choice. And guess what? Here's, here's what I have learned. Um, well, it's been a while, but here's what I've learned. We don't do this on our own. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the one who draws us to him draws us to him, and we call out, Lord, Holy Spirit, do your work in us. Holy Spirit is the one that gives us the ability to make these little habits that will reinforce the identity that we say that we have. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? that the Holy Spirit will draw us in, will reinforce us, give us those thoughts, give us those answers to what habits we need in order to reinforce the identity that we have in Christ and the, the image that we have, the likeness we have, because we were created that way. And then we hold on to that prayer that Jesus had. You will actually glow when you have this presence of the Holy Spirit. One more scripture. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who had the veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed in, in, into His glorious image. We are transformed into the image of God. Our minds are changed, our bodies are changed, our spirits are changed, our emotions are changed. Every ounce of our body is changed. Every molecule in our blood is changed to reflect, to be in the glory of God. It's like we are a glow stick, right? Moses had the veil over his face because he didn't want the people to see that his, his glow was diminishing. Think about that. The only way to keep our glow, to keep our light from fading is to be in the presence of God. That's the only way to do it. And the only, only way that we can do it is with the help of the Holy Spirit. So Holy Spirit, may your light shine through me always, through us always. Hmm. 
as I as I read this, as I read this, just internalize this. Holy Spirit, may your light shine through me always. May I always be in your presence. Not by my power, but by the power of God do I change and live in a kingdom paradise. One more thing that I'm going to, to bless you with, and that is this. This is the uh, Passion Translation. And receive this, please. Proverbs 3, 1 through 6. My child, if you truly want a long and satisfying life, never forget the things that I have taught you. Follow closely every truth that I have given you. Then you will have a full, rewarding life. Hold on to the loyal love and don't let go. And be faithful to all that you've been taught. Let your life be shaped by integrity, with truth written upon your heart. That's how you will find favor and understanding with both God and men. You will gain the reputation of living life well. Trust in the Lord completely, and do not rely on your own opinions. With all your heart, rely on Him to guide you and he will lead you in every decision you make. Become intimate with him in whatever you do, and he will lead you wherever you go. Now, I recognize that that this, I mean, this was a challenging message. It was a challenging message for me uh, because I you know, spoke from my heart, spoke stuff that I'm struggling with. Right? I also recognize that maybe there's somebody in here who doesn't have the relationship or the image that that they they exactly want. So so if if that's you, then then uh, I mean there might be somebody in here that doesn't even know Jesus yet, and that's okay, right? Because today is the day. We can change that. We can change that. So with our heads bowed and in uh, our eyes closed. If that is you, if there's someone in here that is is making a decision to either accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior today, or recommitting, uh, recognizing that they've they've lost the way and coming back, making that turn, then um, then let's just pray. Father, I know that you are good. I believe you, Jesus, that you came to save me. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I'm not condemned anymore because I receive you, Jesus, as the one who saved me from those sins. You paved the way. You redeemed me. And you made that way that I can live truly in your presence. Jesus, I believe in you, and I receive you as my Savior and my King, help me, Lord, to live a life in you. Amen. Thank you again for the opportunity to share with you today. I bless you in the name of our Lord, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May his face shine on you so that you shine in the world that you live in, right? May people see the presence of the Lord in you, and may your glory never fade. Have a wonderful day.